Good morning. I'd uh, like to welcome everybody to this morning service and a beautiful Sunday morning in Sussex, New Jersey. And while we're calming ourselves for worship this morning with the prelude, to please read the first meditation that's in the bulletin or it's on the screen down soon. Once again, Zoomers and Zoomettes and everyone else I can see, it's uh, good to see everybody today. I'm hoping that you're all um, digging the series on women in the Bible. Uh, I'm not much of an Old Testament person. I'm more of a reading the New Testament, but I'm learning a whole lot of stuff. And I'd encourage and invite everybody to go back to uh, Facebook or YouTube and go back and read the other passages going to be previous weeks or even this week's later on this week because I really think you learn a lot of stuff and I'm really enjoying it. Let us join together our call to worship. I will bless the Lord at all times. God's praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes it boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt God's name together. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. We will bless the Lord always. Let us worship God boldly today. Let's join together our first hymn, number 332, verse 1, 3, and 4, Live into Hope.
Please be seated. We come before God, not as despised sinners, but as beloved children of God. We can be bold in being truthful about ourselves and our mistakes because we can trust in God's faithfulness and love for every one of us. Nothing you can do will separate you from God's love. With the confidence of children of God, let us humbly confess our sin. Please join me all together, our unison prayer of confession. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, whose face is hidden from us by our sins, and whose mercy we forget in the blindness of our hearts, cleanse us from all our offenses and deliver us from the proud thoughts and vain desires, that with reverent and humble hearts we may draw near to you, confessing our faults, fighting in your grace, and finding you in our strength. strength. In Jesus Christ, your Son. Friends, the saying is sure and worthy of acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. He himself bore our sin on his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good. Friends, hear the good news of the gospel in Jesus Christ. We are loved and forgiven. Be at peace. Thanks be to God. Amen. And having heard that we are loved and accepted and forgiven and made brand new in Jesus Christ, let us share a sign of Christ's peace with one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Linda. I love the piano because it kind of centers you and focus you. We get into God's word for us today with our prayer for illumination. Please join me. Pour out your Holy Spirit, O God, and prepare our hearts to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may also obey your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. First reading today comes from the book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 23 to 31. After Peter and James were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard it, they raised their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and everything in them, it is you who said by the Holy Spirit, your ancestor, ancestor David, your servant, why did the Gentiles rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers who have gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. For in this city, in fact, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel have gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you had anointed to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Now, Lord, look at their threats and grant to your servants to speak your word with all boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the, through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. When they had prayed, the place in which they had gathered together was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness. God, we thank and praise for the reading of his holy word. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our second reading today comes from the book of Esther, and I took selected verses from chapter three and four. So let us listen now to the story of Esther and see what God will be showing us this morning. Then Haman said, King Ahasuerus, there is a certain people scattered and separated among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people and they do not keep the king's laws. So it is not appropriate for the king to tolerate them. If it pleases the king, let a decree be issued for their destruction and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business so that they may put it into the king's treasuries. When Mordecai learned that all, learned all that had been done Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went through the city wailing with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. When Esther's maids and her eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called for Hatith, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed to her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what was happening and why. Hatith went to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Hatheth went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hatheth and gave him a message for Mordecai saying, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law. All alike are put to death. Only if the king holds out the golden scepter to someone, may that person live. I myself have not been called to come into the king for 30 days. When they told Mordecai what Esther had said, Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silence at such a time as this, 
Relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another quarter, but you and your father's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for such a time as this. Then Esther said in reply to Mordecai, go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf and neither eat nor drink for three days, night, and, night or day. I and my maids will also fast as you do. After that, I will go to the king. Though it's against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Oh, loving God, as we listen to this sermon today, help us to be bold in the ways we live out our faith. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm in shock. It's already August 15th, and we're already in our pen ultimate worship service for this series on women in the Bible. There's only one more to go after this Sunday, and it just goes to show you how quickly time really does fly. We started our series way back in July, in the middle of it, where we looked at Rachel and Leah's story in Genesis. And then after that, it was Rahab in the beginning of Joshua, followed by Hannah in 1 Samuel and Elizabeth in Luke 1. We did those on the same week. And then last week was Bathsheba in 2 Samuel. And today is Esther from the book of Esther. I've always had a soft spot in my heart for Esther and Ruth because they have books in the Bible named after them. As a little girl, I always thought that was so remarkable. To have a book named after you in the most famous book in the whole world? I mean, come on, that's pretty great. And Esther is different from the other women we've looked at so far, not only because she has a book of the Bible named after her, but also because of how far in the future she is from where we left off. With Bathsheba. The book of Esther takes place uh, during the Persian Empire, which is considerably later than the beginnings of the unified Israelite kingdom with David as the king. Lots of things had to happen, and you can read all about it in 1st and 2nd Kings or 1st and 2nd Chronicles. They share, they say the same thing basically with little tweaks, as well as other prophets who addressed more personally the time rather than just like a history of the time. And so now the shortest summary that I can possibly give, which does major injustice to very important plot points, is that Solomon takes over David's throne. Then after Solomon dies, his son takes over the throne, as you would expect, but he doesn't handle it too well. The northern tribes, who barely arranged themselves with the southern tribes of Judah and Benjamin, during David's time, he brings them together, they leave the fragile union and become their own kingdom. So then we have the northern kingdom and we have the kingdom of Judah. The two kingdoms operate in relative harmony with one another, but not so much with their God. The gods of the Canaanites prove to be very tempting and people repeatedly leave behind God and worship those other gods instead. A cycle begins of a prophet coming around and some people repenting, and this happens again and again. Eventually, the Northern Kingdom gets overthrown and exiled by the Assyrians. The Southern Kingdom of Judah, with Jerusalem as its capital city and the family line of David as its king, continues to govern themselves somewhat freely for an extra 80-ish years. Then the Babylonians come and eventually they seize Jerusalem and Judah also 
falls. And all the wealthier people are exiled to Babylon. Then after some more time, Babylon falls to the Persian Empire. This is the empire that we find ourselves in in the book of Esther. So yes, quite a bit more time has passed and lots of fighting and devastation has happened since we looked at the story of Bathsheba last week. The book of Esther itself looks at the young woman, Esther. Her uncle slash guardian, Mordecai, not Mordecai, Malachi, no, yeah. And how they were together to overturn a genocide of their people because of the jealous royal favorite, Haman. The case name is Ahasuerus. So by chapters three and four, Esther's the queen of Persia. And a big part of the story is that Malachi told her to keep her family line, her Jewish identity, a secret. So she does. And this story, let me tell you, is a wonderful novella, a little short novel. And it's totally worth a read. I think I, I rate it four and a half stars. Anyway, Ahasuerus doesn't know Esther is a Jew. And so when Haman approaches him with the preposition to kill off all the Jews, Ahasuerus doesn't disagree. Haman presents the case that Jewish people are lawbreakers because they worship in a different way and they follow a different set of laws than everyone else. An important note, Haman is jealous of Malachi. And so he does this to get rid of Malachi and everyone like him. Remember, they don't know about Esther's family and the fact that Malachi is her uncle. Now, all this drama, we, Mordecai, oh, thank you. Okay, all this drama leads to this pivotal conversation between Mordecai and Esther, though not face to face, but through her palace staff. At first, Esther doesn't want to talk to the king about it because she's worried for her own life. Perhaps she even thinks, what good would she be if she tries to talk to Ahasuerus and ends up dead instead? Mordecai doesn't let her off the hook. Instead, he says this striking verse. Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. Bam. He hits her with a doozy. It seems very important and also a little bit of a guilt trip. So this prompts Esther to walk into the bullpen and approach Ahasuerus in his royal hall, even to forsake her own life. I won't spoil the ending. I will say it's most definitely worth a read and it inspired a Jewish holiday still celebrated to this day her. So anyway, the thing from this scene that really strikes me about Esther is her boldness. When push comes to shove, she stands up for the challenge. She really doesn't want to do this scary thing, this thing that could literally kill her, depending upon the whim of Ahasuerus, who is temperamental and easily influenced. You know what they say, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Well, that's this king. You could look up power corruption in a dictionary and see the picture of Ahasuerus right there. So once Esther makes up her mind to be bold and to go before the king, she prepares herself by calling a fast for herself, her maids, and the Jewish people in Susa, the capital city. The book itself doesn't outline why she does this, but fasting was, and is, an important aspect of Judaism. It gives followers the opportunity to focus on God through prayer, rather than thinking about food. So once that three-day fast was over, Esther goes into bold hyperdrive and goes before the king. He grants her permission to be there once she shows up in front of him. Remember, King Ahasuerus is a flighty character compared to Mordecai's steadfast one. 
Esther goes through her plan and eventually things turn out much better than expected for the Jewish people in Persia. But I'll let you read it yourself to see what else happens. It's quite a fun book to read, like I've said. So overall, the book of Esther celebrates a time when the Jewish people triumphed over those who tried to kill them. Professor Lynn Japinga writes in her book. God was not the obvious rescuer in this story as God was in the Exodus. God is not even mentioned in this book. The Jews appear to deliver themselves from evil through the intelligence and courage of Esther and Mordecai. Esther had limited power and yet she used it to save her people. She took a risk, spoke the truth to power and confronted injustice. That's right, folks. Did you catch the fun fact of the day in this quote? The book of Esther doesn't mention God once, not even once. It's the only book in the Bible to do that. And yet it's in our Bible because it speaks of a truth found in God's relationship with humanity. That even when we can't see it, God is there with us. Even when we feel alone, God is with us. God gives us the courage to be bold. Imagine you're a Jewish person living in Persia. It's likely you were born there. Persia is your home. And then one day you go to the market and you hear a royal decree that on a random day in about a year, your neighbors will have the chance to kill you and your family for absolutely no reason. I would bet you'd feel incredibly alone and isolated from your non-Jewish neighbors and from your God. How could God let this happen? And why would God let this happen? Mordecai and Esther don't let this disgusting act of state-sanctioned planned genocide stop them from acting in boldness and with lots of courage to change the outcome. Esther was in shock when she first heard the news and didn't immediately jump into an offensive position. But that shock didn't stop her. Instead, she becomes a champion of all her people. She has such boldness. And she's not alone in that fact. The early Christ followers were also persecuted for their faith. In the book of Acts, that looks at the early spread of the Christian faith, we see this testament to many people's faith and trust in Christ. In our reading from Acts today, Peter and John don't back down from sharing the ways Christ changed their lives through his death and resurrection, even after being arrested. In a couple chapters, the first Christian martyr will be killed. And that doesn't slow down those early followers from sharing the good news of Jesus to the world. They're incredibly bold in sharing how they've been transformed by Jesus Christ. I've definitely not been anywhere near as bold as they were in sharing my faith. Do I shy away from it? No. In fact, in college, people looked at me like I had five heads when I told them that I would get up on Sunday morning to go to church and not just sleep in. I choose to think that my evangelism, my sharing the good news of Jesus Christ is more active in how I act more than the words I say. I think it's reflective of a few other things I've heard like more is caught than taught or actions speak louder than words. Both of these phrases bring to mind that it's important how we act and that people react much more to what we do than what we say. Of course, our words can and are impactful, especially when they're hurtful. Or at least for me, words are definitely more impactful when they're hurtful. Maybe you're different and words mean much more to you than actions. Like my husband, whose top love language is words of affirmation. I know y'all exist out there. And yet, we can't deny how much human beings do catch on 
by modeling rather than telling. Just take a little child and you'll probably know exactly what I mean, right? And even our memories are generally more captive to the way someone made us feel than any one thing anybody said. Like, I don't remember much of what my kindergarten teacher taught me or said to me, but I know I felt loved and important every time I was in her classroom. I remember feeling valued. My whole self was valued in that classroom, not just a portion of me. Even when I misbehaved by talking to my neighbor during nap time, my teacher's loving response, rather than the words she said, reminded me to be quiet. Her way of being was much more instrumental to my development. And I truly believe that when I live in a way that shows all people that I love and respect them just for being them, that I'm proclaiming the truth of Jesus Christ, that God's love for us is so immense that God came down in human form to tear down the wall between humanity and the divine. The ways we live our lives as disciples of Jesus Christ, the ways that speak to love, kindness, humility, generosity, justice, and equity, put us at opposing sides to the general goals of the world, to other people, to always be right and to always win, to find ways to separate or to be at the top. Our boldness in faith means not buying into those notions and instead listening to God's view of humanity. We are worthy, we are loved, and we are God's children, all of us. We're all made the same in and through Jesus. In Esther's story, she's bold in defying the built up us versus them way of separating her people from the majority by stopping the planned genocide of her people. And we see the steps taken even further in the New Testament with the first followers of Jesus opening up their ministry of spreading the news about Jesus, not only to fellow Jews, but to Gentiles as well. And Paul goes even further when he says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. What a radical statement that is still true today. Friends, as we hear of ways to separate ourselves from others, be it from the news or social media or even one another, let us be bold to not live that way. I know this is hard because it's how our brains love to function, and that's why it's the bold thing to do. Share your faith in whatever way you can, including by working to see everyone as members of God's family and as being worthy of all of our love, care, and commitment. You never know when living a little bit different might just turn out to be your and my and our time such as this. Um. Please stand as you are able in body or in spirit and join in our next hymn, number 434, verses 1, 2, and 4. Today we are all called to be disciples.
let's all join together and boldly, let's all join together and boldly proclaim what we believe our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, who was crucified, dead, and buried. He ascended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. And then he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. That's where we take the time to share the good news and the hard news of our congregation and church family with our sharing of joys and concerns. Um, go to the congregation, we're all a congregation, zoom in, <laughs> but go to the sanctuary first. So joys and concerns in the sanctuary? Cheryl? Wow, cool. God mercy in our prayer. Betsy? Just when it gets cool around here, you gonna leave? God mercy in our prayer. Walter? I just had a joy with Linda. What a beautiful job you just did. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Rachel? On Zoom? Uh, yeah. Oh, hang on. Possibly the Jesus here. Rich, you have any other? No, we're good. No, I'm getting out. Uh, Thank you all for sharing. Uh, for those of you on Zoom, in case you couldn't hear, Cheryl shared a joy of being able to go to Colorado and spending time with all of her brothers for the first time in 16 years. Very exciting. Uh, Betsy prayed for, uh, asked for prayers for travel mercies for her and Eric. They are traveling in the next couple of weeks. Uh, Walt shared a joy for Linda's amazing gifts. She has really showed them to us today for sure. Uh, Rachel continued to ask for prayers for her grandfather, Robert. Uh, he's been moved out of Morristown. Uh, so just prayers for his continued recovery because it's probably a long journey. So those are the prayer requests for today. I hope now that you've heard them, you'll pray for them too. But now let us all join our hearts together in prayer this morning. Let us pray. Everlasting God, you are the true source of life for the world. And now we turn to you in prayer as a sign of our trust in your name and in your presence in the world today. Help us to be bold enough to see the world through your eyes. Sovereign God, you are the true ruler of the world. We pray that our, lo our leaders, local, national, and international, will seek you first in all things. May they embrace your call to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with you. Guide all the decision makers to lead positive change that will bring forth your kingdom here on earth today. 
trustworthy God, you are the true source of joy and goodness in the world. We thank you for the many ways we've been blessed by you. For this earth where we make our home, for the sun which provides us light and the ability to grow food, for water that nourishes the earth and gives us the liquid we need to thrive. We also thank you for people's gifts, like, she, like Linda's amazing gift of music and the joy she brings to us all as she puts her whole self into playing and worshiping you through it. We thank you for the ability to spend time with family, especially family we haven't seen in so many years, just like Cheryl had the chance to visit with her brothers in Colorado. We thank you, God, for the ability to travel. And with that, we pray for your mercy as traveling happens, especially for Betsy and Eric in the coming weeks, as well as for all the other people we know who are probably traveling due to the summer and wanting to get out and experience the last bit of summer before school begins. Help us, oh God, in all that we do to trust you more and more. Healer God, you are the true source of healing and comfort for the world. We pray for the people in Haiti as they begin to start again after this weekend's devastating earthquake. We lift up to you those who are sick, those who are grieving, those who are lonely, those who are desperate, those who are hungry, and those who are depressed. We especially pray for your healing for Robert as he continues to recover. Oh God, we don't know how long that will take, but we pray for your presence with him and with his family as they all support him and his care staff. We know, oh God, that you know all the prayers of our hearts, spoken and unspoken. And so we lay down our hearts at your feet. Eternal God, you are the true source of courage in this world. Help us to be courageous, to live out your callings in our lives. Help us to take those terrifying first steps into boldness, to be different, and to proclaim your love and grace in our words and actions. Use us, O oh God, for your kingdom's sake. Ruler of all, you are the true source of life and light in this world. May we be mirrors of it. May your whole church be unified in your love for all your children. May we be connected through time and space to sing with all believers of the goodness of your grace. We now join together, God, with the multitude to proclaim your will be done through the prayer Jesus taught us, saying together now, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I just want to say a quick aside. There was a spider on my microphone, so I was acting in boldness. <laughs> uh, and now it is our time in our service where we give back out of a joyful response to all that God has done. And as we celebrate the ways God is active in our lives today, just as God was active in the lives of the women in the Bible all the way back to the beginning of God's special relationship with humanity, we offer back to God a portion of what we've been given. Please give joyously and with God's kingdom here on earth in mind. And of course, we have lots of little bowls to leave them in as you leave today. Now, would you please stand as you are able in body or in spirit to join in the doxology this morning? <laughs>
And now please join me in our unison prayer of dedication. God of abundance, you've blessed us beyond what we can imagine. Help us to be bold givers, giving of ourselves out of thanksgiving for the life-giving gift of Jesus Christ. Use these gifts and offerings to bless this church family and the wider community surrounding us. In Christ's name, we lay our offerings at your throne. Amen. You may be seated. Now is our time for opportunities to serve and any announcements. I know we have at least one from the sanctuary. You want to go first? Uh, just two of them. Actually, first of all, if you're familiar with the Methodist Church in the Barn Sale, we're having a book sale next weekend by the Saturday afternoon. So, something. If you ever been there, we got one of them. So, the other announcement, of course, is next Thursday night and the Thursday night following the local library. There's going to be the music of the next series starting at 6 30. And hopefully, our money will hold up. Thank you. Thank you. Well, he announced a book sale at the Methodist Church uh, on Friday and Saturday from nine to two. It's only five dollars a bag. Sounds like a great deal. And I also know from that flyer that the barn will also be open. So they'll have the book sale and the barn will be open. Also, he announced once again the concert series the library is hosting this Thursday, the 19th, as well as the following Thursday, the 26th. And that's at 6.30 p.m., am I correct? I know because I looked it up on the website. Um, so the announcements I have, uh, does anybody else have any others? Perfect. Uh, as a reminder, September 5th, we move back to 10.30 a.m. for worship. So that's, believe it or not, very soon. So September 5th, which is the Sunday of Labor Day, we'll be back 10.30 a.m. instead of 9.30. So you get another hour to prepare yourself for worship. Maybe sleep in a little bit. I don't know. Do whatever you got to do. But September 5th, 10.30. If you show up at 9.30, I'll be here. We can chit-chat. But it won't be time for worship. Uh, the next thing I want to remind you, if you didn't uh, grab an updated directory last Sunday, they're still in the Narfex. The pink covers, that's how you know it's the new one. They'll be updated addresses and names and things names, numbers is what I meant to say, <laughs> they're in the narthex. Uh, finally, I'll be away for the first few days, first, la let's start over. I'll be away the last few days of August through the first few days of September. So I'll be gone August 29th, I believe is the last Sunday in August. I'll be away for that Sunday. I know we will have someone who will be wonderful to help fill the role of preacher that day. Uh, and then I'll be back that first Sunday in September when we go back to 10.30, I'll be here again. I don't know if anybody else will be because it's Labor Day weekend, but I'll be here. Okay, so those are my announcements. Do we have any other to share? Okay, seeing none, let us stand in body or spirit to close out our worship with hymn 372, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian, verses 1, 2, and 4. <laughs>
sense, go from this place being bold in the ways you live out your faith. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. You're off that. You have to use the pad. So oh, yeah, yeah. I need these. Where are you off the I'm going to stop recording now. Oh.